Hello, everyone. My name is Shakela Alvarenga. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mob Museum. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's program, King of the Bootleggers, The Rise, Fall, and Betrayal of George Remus. It is really a pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's program, Karen Abbott. Abbott is the New York Times bestseller author of Sin in the Second City, American Rose and Liar Temptress Soldier Spy. Her newest book, The Ghosts of Eden Park, tells the story of George Remus, the biggest bootlegger in Prohibition era. I won't spoil this fascinating story for you though. We will hold a book signing downstairs in the retail store immediately following tonight's program. And with that being said, please welcome our speaker for tonight, Karen Abbott. Thank you, Shakela, for the introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I haven't been to Vegas in uh, I don't know, a million years. Um, I think I'm scarred from all the money I lost the last time I was here, but it's really great to be back. I don't know how many local people are here, but I did a little digging on, um, just for a little preamble to give a, a taste of tonight's discussion, a little uh, taste of uh, Las Vegas history. So apparently you all had a, um, a sheriff named Sam Gay, who was a very colorful guy. Uh, and in 1930, he announced that he was retiring as the sheriff of Clark County, not because he was turning 70 years old, but because they were about to build the Hoover Dam and he was wary all, of all the criminals that were about to come to town. Um, and just a little bit more about Sam from the Review Journal. But there will never be another like Sam Gay, six foot two with a chest like a barrel, who once drank more whiskey than any man in the state of Nevada, which was doing considerable drinking in a state noted for its prodigious thirst. He doesn't drink anymore. Quote, I quit after they started making the stuff out of old shoes, he says. They call it good whiskey and make faces when they drink it. When I did my drinking, men smacked their lips as it rolled down. So if you have a cocktail tonight, please raise a glass for old Sam Gay, who sounds like one of your very most interesting characters. Um, and speaking of interesting characters, we're here to talk tonight about George Remus. Um, I write a lot of narrative nonfiction, and I think George Remus is one of the most fascinating people I've ever come across, um, so I'm just going to dive in. Um, I usually get my ideas, there's the cover of my book, by the way, the hardcover. Um, I usually get my ideas from, from uh, going to archives, uh, reading old newspapers, um, checking out, you know, out-of-print books, but I actually got the idea for the Ghost of Eden Park from watching television. Um, I don't know if anybody here watched Boardwalk Empire which was a really fantastic show on HBO, um, ran about five seasons. If you need something new to binge, I highly recommend it. Um, it was a brilliant show. It perfectly captured the dawn of the 1920s. Um, bootleggers were just planning, um, beginning to plot ways to circumvent all of the new prohibition laws, and nobody had yet heard of Al Capone. Um, and there's a minor character on Boardwalk Empire named George Remus. Uh, here he is portrayed by the excellent actor Glenn Fleshler, who actually very much looks like Remus. It's kind of uncanny. And Remus was so innovative and so cuckoo, and I wondered if he was actually a real-life character. Um, you know, he spoke of himself in the third person, uh, as, as evidenced by this little still here. Um, he's on the phone with Steve Buscemi's character, Nucky Thompson, in this still. Um, and he's, they're wheeling and dealing, and things are getting a little bit heated. And Remus says, Remus finds you petty and resentful. And Steve Buscemi, they cut to Steve Buscemi and says, well, Remus can go fuck himself. Um, <laughs> But he stole every scene he was in. So, so I really did want to know if, if he was a real person, and of course, indeed, he was a real person. And the real George Remus also spoke of himself in the third person. Um, he would say things like, it's going to be a hell of a Christmas for Remus. So many people want to kill Remus. And my personal favorite, Remus's brain exploded. Um, I'll let you, if you want to read the book, you'll see if the brain explosion actually was literal or figurative. Um, but he was the most bizarre and outlandish character I've met, ever met in history, and I'm really excited to tell you about him. So before I get into George Remus, I just want to take a minute to talk about researching George Remus. Um, this is the overhead scanner at Yale University Law Library, um, which had a 5,500-page trial transcript um, that was invaluable to the research for this book. Um, and from opening to closing, I sat in the Yale Law Library and just Xeroxed every single page of it. I don't know if there's any research buffs out there, but this was the most beautiful piece of equipment I've ever seen in my life. You know, it was 
um, instead of having to lug the book around, the big trail transcript, and like put it down and, and miss everything and get a hernia. It just it just magically Xeroxed it from above. Um, it was everybody should have one of these things. And it had the most fascinating tidbits. One of my favorite tidbits in this trial transcript was the fact that George Remus did not wear underwear. Um, so of course in the 1920s, this was cause for great alarm. Um, going commando was apparently the sign of an unsound mind. Um, so I went through all of this trial transcript. It took me about four months to take notes, and it resulted in an 85,000 word outline, which was almost the length of the book itself. Um, and I, I was really lucky to have so much great primary source material for this book. Um, often, you don't often get that when you're writing nonfiction, enough to actually structure the book like a, like a whodunit, um, which, which is really fun to do with nonfiction. So um, I, I, I don't talk about the ending here, so if anybody um, doesn't know the ending of how, of how things turn out for George Remus, um, I try not to spoil it. So um, anyway, just wanted to say that up front. So here is George Remus. This is one of the most, I guess, popular pictures of him. And how do you solve a problem like George Remus? Uh, his life was so much more dramatic than anything that was portrayed on Boardwalk Empire. He emigrated from Germany when he was just a little kid and settled in Chicago. His father was a mean and abusive alcoholic. Um, George had to quit school when he, at age 13 to start working and help support his family. He started working in his uncle's pharmacy, um, and he really enjoyed this job. He called himself a druggist devil boy. He often slept on the cot in the back room of the pharmacy because he was afraid to go home. His father was really pretty violent. He became a pharmacist, and at night, he decided he wanted to start studying law. He studied law at night. He eventually became a lawyer, a very well-respected defense attorney in Chicago. And he became known for his very dramatic courtroom antics. He would leap across the courtroom, he would cry and tear at his hair, and he would start smacking opposing counsel and starting fistfights. Um, his, his admirers, of which there were many, called him the Napoleon of the Chicago Bar, but his detractors, of which there were also many, called him the weeping, crying Remus. Um, and so in early 1920, uh, he started noticing a new type of client on his docket. Um, it was men charged with violating prohibition laws. And they were making such easy money. You know, they would come into Remus's office, pay the fines with cash, walk out, and just start doing their business again. Remus knew he was much smarter than all of these men that he was defending, and he saw a chance to clean up, in his own words. He scoured the Volstead Act, and he found a loophole, and this loophole was that with a physician's prescription, it was legal to buy, sell, distribute, and use um, alcohol for quote-unquote medicinal purposes. Um, so Remus knew how ridiculous this was, and it was a provision he deemed in a customary flourish of language. Remus had such a great way with words, and I'll get into that a little bit later on too. But he called it the greatest comedy, the greatest perversion of justice that I've ever known of any civilized country in the world. And a plan began to take shape in his mind. This is Imogene Holmes. Imogene was a very big part of Remus's plan. Um, she was a dust girl, as they called cleaning women back in the day, um, for his, in his Chicago law office. She was a single mother of a, of a little girl named Ruth. And she would stay after hours, and she and Remus would start commiserating about their mutually miserable marriages. Um, Imogene's husband was always out philandering, spending all of their money. Um, Remus's first wife, um, uh, had filed a divorce complaint that accused him of having, quote, a habit of coming home early in the morning. And I just love old divorce filings. That's actually something you would put on a divorce filing in 1919. You have a habit of coming home early in the morning. Um, so they decided to leave their spouses. They got together. They planned their own wedding. Remus was very impressed with Imogene. I think he thought that she had street smarts, she was savvy, she was somebody who was as ambitious as he was. He, she understood, having come from a poor background herself, what it took to really um, assert yourself and make, make your way from nothing. Um, he trusted her, he confided in her. He had many nicknames for her, but one of his first nicknames was Prime Minister, um, which I think really sort of suggested the level of respect he had for her savvy. Um, meanwhile, Imogene had only one nickname for George Remus, and that nickname was Daddy. <laughs> um, it, sort of, uh, it sort of gives you an idea of, of the relationship she had with him. So this is um, Remus's uh, mansion in Cincinnati. Uh, Remus, Imogene, and the daughter Ruth moved to Cincinnati. It was a very strategic location. 80% um, of the country's pre-prohibition bonded whiskey was in a 300-mile radius of Cincinnati. Um, and this, this mansion that they bought was in a very expensive, um, exclusive neighborhood called Price Hill. 
They planned extensive renovations, and it was a wedding gift for Imogene. Um, Remus actually put the deed in her name. It was one of the many decisions he would come to regret. Um, I think that Remus uh, very much loved Imogene in his own way, a, a very flawed love, to say the least. Um, but Imogene was sort of upfront with her intentions from the very start. She actually confided to a friend that she wanted to, quote, roll Remus for his role. This is George Connors. Um, if anybody knows uh, Remus, the, this name might have come up. Um, Remus met him soon after moving to Cincinnati. Uh, Connors was a, an entrenched um, Cincinnati figure, uh, well-known in politics, well-known in real estate, sort of a connected guy. And he was a really good friend to Remus. Um, he had the exact opposite temperament. You know, Remus was this volatile guy who would leap up and strangle you for apparently no reason. Um, and Connors was the guy who was gonna calm him down and sort of talk him down and bring him back to reason. Um, and once Connors was in place, they had decided to join forces for Remus's bootlegging empire. Remus implemented his scheme. Now, I just, I have to emphasize how brilliant Remus's scheme was. It was consisted of four uh, parts. Number one was to buy distilleries to gain pro uh, possession of the pre-prohibition -pro bonded whiskey that I had mentioned earlier. Number two was to acquire wholesale drug companies. Number three was to obtain withdrawal permits that would allow him to remove whiskey from those warehouses and sell it on the legal medicinal market. And number four, this was the true genius of his plan. Remus formed his own production, um, transportation company. So he had one fleet of men who were distributing the alcohol to the legal curative market, and he had this other fleet of trucks who would hijack the first set of trucks, <laughs> steal all the liquor on side, and then divert all of that alcohol to the illegal market at any price that Remus named. So he was basically robbing Remus to pay Remus. And he called this the circle, makes sense. Um, within a year of launching the circle, Remus owned 35% 35, 35 of all of the alcohol in the United States, which is just a staggering figure to me. Um, and of course, Remus being Remus, he had a comment on this feat in the third person. Remus was in the whiskey business, he said. And Remus was the biggest man in the business. Cincinnati was the American mecca for good liquor and America had to come to Remus to get it. His fortune this time was estimated to be between 20 million and 40 million dollars, and that is a figure that's not adjusted for inflation. That's in 1921. And the irony of all this is that George Remus was a teetotaler who never drank a drop of alcohol in his life. This is Death Valley. This is uh, Remus's storage facility. It was located just outside of Cincinnati proper. And Connors found um, this property for Remus after he suffered a, a, pi a whiskey pirate attack. Um, now, whiskey pirates are not uh, ahoy matey pirates, the traditional pirates, but they were these roving bands of thieves who would descend upon warehouses, bound and gag the watchmen, and steal all the alcohol inside. And um, he had a battle with one of these, and apparently Remus was so um, uh, productive in this battle, beating all of the men down, um, that the, the, uh, the, liquor, the whiskey pirate said that he basically deserved to keep his liquor. Um, uh, and Remus being Remus and how smart he was, he hired these whiskey pirates to be on his team so they wouldn't attack him again. Um, but he named this Death Valley. It was a, an impenetrable fortress. He had uh, men stationed everywhere with guns, um, pistols, automatics. There was a very elaborate um, blinking of lights to make sure that you knew the code to get, to get in. Um, and rum, runner, rum runners who would come here from all across the country were really treated as visiting royalty. And you know, Remus uh, really rolled out the welcome mat. Uh, they got a car wash, they got a fresh hot meal, they could sleep over, they had craps games. Remus would extend them lines of credit to play cards. Um, and so it was this really sort of well-functioning, well-oiled machine for Remus. And it kept out the whiskey pirates, but it would not keep out the prohibition agents, as Remus would soon learn. So the rum runners would come from all around the country. They would take Remus's booze, sell it back in their hometowns, including to local speakeasies. And I really was delighted to find this um, during my research for this book. This is an actual speakeasy menu from a Chicago speakeasy circa 1924. And you can see some of the really great cocktail names, uh, the Dirty Dick Special, the Maiden's Prayer. My personal favorite is the Corpse Reviver, which as the name suggests is actually a hangover cure. Um, so, so uh, you know, very useful thing to have. And of course, the prices can't be beat. I don't think we'll ever see a champagne cocktail for 75 cents again. Um, but it's really wonderful that this survived all of these years and uh, a really great piece of prohibition history. So here is George Remus with his mother, Marie Remus. Um, Remus was an unabashed mama's boy. 
Aside from Imogene, his mother, Marie, was the most important uh, woman in his life. And she, she had had a very hard life, you know, immigrating from Germany. Um, she was, in fact, so beleaguered that she could actually not remember the names of four children who had died. Um, she and Remus were always very close, and this closest was illustrated by, by one of my favorite incidents that I write about in the book. Um, of course, uh, Remus's father was a drunk and sort of belligerent guy. Apparently, as the story goes, they were in a Chicago saloon, uh, neighborhood saloon one night. They got into a fight, and Marie Remus took a uh, bottle and bashed her husband over the head with this bottle. Um, he died from this wound. Now, George Remus, wanting to protect his mother and to keep her from speaking indiscriminately to the coroner, locked her in an attic for four days until the inquest was over. Um, which just to me just said a lot about George Remus and the lengths that he was willing to go to to get out of trouble. So Remus was a very jealous person, um, which comes up a lot in his story. But all of his jealousy was really directed toward his wife, Imogene. He wanted to know, he was so enamored with her that he wanted to know what she was doing at all times. Um, and a really chilling incident uh, that, I, that I write about um, is once he came home from a business trip, it was the middle of the night, and Imogene was not home. Um, a servant told Remus that Imogene had some friends, had accompanied a salesman to Indiana. They just went off to Indiana for the evening. Now, Remus knew exactly who the salesman was. He didn't like this guy. He didn't trust this guy. And he knew exactly where she would be. Um, and that was the Claypool Hotel in, in Indianapolis, which was one of the really majestic hotels in uh, Indianapolis at this time. So Remus, of course, decides right in the middle of the night to go out to Indianapolis and track down Imogene and the salesman. And he brings with him a loaded cane. Now, I had to look up what a loaded cane was. It was a gentleman's accessory that was popular at the time that was weighted at one end, so it could also be used as a weapon. So he goes to the Claypool Hotel. He finds out what room Imogene is in. Uh, there was a small mercy. She was not in the same room as the salesman. Um, and he finds out what room the salesman is in. And he takes the elevator up to the room. He knocks on the door. The poor salesman answers his door. Remus raises his loaded cane. And I'm just going to leave that there. So by mid-1921, the renovations on the Price Hill Mansion in Cincinnati were complete. These renovations totaled $750,000, which is about $12 million in today's money. So just a lot of money just th being thrown around here already. The mansion consisted of 31 rooms, very carefully curated uh, by Remus and Imogene. You know, there were chandeliers the size of cars, imported artwork and rugs. There was a $50,000 um, $50, signature of George Washington that was Remus's prized possession. And as you might be able to discern from this picture, uh, Remus was not a minimalist. Um, <laughs> Sort of uh, anything that you wanted to throw in the room uh, was, was good. Um, I, I have to just mention the, the piano, which you can't tell from the picture because it's black and white, but it was a gold piano. And in my first book, it's in the Second City, it was about a very famous brothel in Chicago that operated around the turn of the century called the Everly Club. And there was a very uh, a, a gold piano in the Everly Club, and nobody ever knew what happened to it. So I just like to think that the gold piano from the Everly Club somehow ended up in Marie uh, Remus's mansion 20 years later, but I have no idea if that's true. Here's another room from the mansion, a little bit more tasteful. This is the solarium. And, and the mansion in general just really illustrates George and Imogene's desire to be accepted by society. Um, not just Cincinnati society, but across the country. They had these grand social aspirations, um, and, and they really wanted to sort of establish themselves as people who had made it. And to that end, they decided to throw a New Year's Eve bash in 1921. Here is actually the invitation from that New Year's Eve bash. I can't believe, also, I can't believe this survived. I'm sorry, I get very excited when, <laughs> when things survive. Um, it's the research geek in me. But um, this is the actual invitation for their 1921 party. Um, they sent these invitations to journalists, politicians, judges, captains of industry, including some very important Cincinnati families. Of course, that would include the Taft family, William Howard Taft, the president, um, various other illustrious Longhorse, the Sintons. Um, and if, all, if it all went well, you know, this was their big social debut, they would finally be accepted. Uh, I don't know if you can read the text on the um, invitation, which Imogene designed, by the way. Um, but it says, our New Year's greeting, dive to health, swim to wealth, float on happiness, 1921, 1922. And considering the level of debauchery planned at this party, I don't quite understand the mom and the baby. <laughs> Seems a little, <laughs> a little out, of, uh, out of sync there, but whatever Imogene wanted, Imogene got, and she's the one who designed these. 
So here is Imogene in her brand, uh, brand new renovated boudoir. I love this picture of her. Um, just the, the, historical de the, the historical furniture, the lamp. I love the dress. And I love, can you imagine the poor photographer that had to take this picture probably over and over and over again to get the right exact expression of Imogene looking into the mirror? Um, Anyway, it was um, a very important night for her. You know, she was finally somebody. She was Mrs. George Remus, and she wanted to capitalize on that. Uh, one of Remus's friends gave Imogene this rather flattering appraisal. She was the kind of woman that made you think of Turkish Arabs, Oriental dances, and Cleopatra. Her long, fizzed brown hair always seemed to be falling about her dusky, olive-tinted face. Her every glance seemed to caress. Although she was voluptuous to the point of stoutness, there was something feline in her every movement. So here's one of my favorite cartoons. Um, you know, pa papers at this time were very interested in, in cartoons, and they don't really do this kind of thing anymore. But this was a, a cartoon depiction of exactly what went on at this famous party. Um, it shows the Greco-Roman swimming pool, which was actually uh, cost $175,000. Um, that, that number, $100,000, is wrong. Um, uh, Remus christened this pool the Imogene Bass in honor of his wife. The pool was heated, which, as you can imagine, was an absurd luxury for this time period. They all had all kinds of bass, um, needle bass, um, including electric bass, which I had to look these up. They were an early version of a tanning bed. They were heated by incandescent lights and said to make the user frisky. Um, it just seems like they would electrocute you, but I, I don't know. Um, so there were water nymphs doing synchronized swimming routines. There were guests using the rostrum, uh, uh, the diving board as a rostrum to deliver toasts. Um, Imogene, of course, appeared in her daring one piece to execute a dive. And Remus handed out party favors, um, uh, really elaborate party favors. There were diamond stick pins and watches for the men. Um, there were a, a brand new 1922 car for every woman. It's like decades before Oprah, you know, you get a car, you get a car. Um, and every single guest had a $1,000 bill tucked underneath, underneath their plate. That would be like if you looked under your seats right now and found $14,000. Um, which is just kind of crazy. Um, and a gesture emblematic of the times, and one that would be remembered for decades later, Remus lit his guests' uh, cigars with $100 bills. Now, just to put this all into perspective, this is at a time when the average annual salary, the average yearly salary, was only $1,200. So just sort of a staggering, disgusting <laughs> display of wealth. Here's a picture of the watch that Remus would give out to all the men, the engraved watch, Mr. and Mrs. George Remus, 1921. And it is this party that actually um, um, sort of developed the, the lore that, that F. Scott Fitzgerald based Jay Gatsby on George Remus. There are all of these apocryphal stories that George Remus and F. Scott Fitzgerald met when Fitzgerald was stationed in Louisville during his military service. There's no hard evidence, um, but there are all of these great stories. Um, but it's definitely true that F. F. Scott Fitzgerald, even if he hadn't met George Remus, definitely knew who George Remus was at this time. The entire world knew who George Remus was by this time. And I think the parallels between George Remus's life and that of Jay Gatsby are, are quite conspicuous. You know, both men owned a string of pharmacies, both lived in an opulent mansion, both were in love with an enigmatic woman, um, both threw lavish parties. And as Fitzgerald writes, um, Gatsby sprang from a platonic conception of himself. You know, he invented a persona for a world that he wished to inhabit, even if the world didn't welcome him in. Like, he wanted to belong to a world that didn't quite, where he didn't quite belong. And I think that both Gatsby and Remus, uh, that's a, a theme that runs throughout both of their lives. This is Mabel Walker Willenbrandt. Um, she was also a character on Boardwalk Empire, but in the show they called her Esther Randolph. Um, she's such a rich and complicated character. When President Warren Harding appointed her to be the Assistant Attorney General of the United States in 1921, women had only had the right to vote for nine months. She was 32 years old, five years out of law school, and had never prosecuted a single case in her career. And suddenly she was in charge of all prohibition cases across the country, including cases against George Remus. Now you might wonder why Warren Harding and Harry Dougherty and all of the, the people in the Justice Department decided to hire Will and Brandt. And you can just imagine them thinking, oh, let's hire the little lady. She's inexperienced. She's not going to know what she's doing. She's going to be intimidated. She's going to be overwhelmed. And we'll be able to continue our cozy relationship and our quid pro quo with the bootleggers. Of course, the whole and Harding administration was steeped in business with the bootleggers. But of course, Will and Brandt defied all of these expectations. She takes the oath of office in 1921 and just begins kicking some butt. Um, she was the most powerful woman in the country. Um, you can imagine the sexism she had to deal with. I mean, there were entire newspaper articles just devoted to her hands, um, which were very bizarre. Um, she had a serious hearing problem. 
which is one of the most remarkable things about her. She spent an hour every morning styling her hair to conceal her hearing aids, as you might be able to tell from that photo. Um, she was almost inhumanly tough and thick-skinned, qualities that were reinforced by the ice-cold bath she took every morning. Um, her favorite saying was, quote, life has few petted darlings, and she certainly didn't consider herself one of, herself one of them. Uh, one of my favorite things about Willem Brandt, um, her formative child event, uh, she once bit a pet cat's ear, and to teach her a lesson, her father bit her ear back. So soon after George Remus's big New Year's Eve bash, a letter, letter, a letter lands on her desk, and the letter, wrote, the letter writer wrote, all of Cincinnati is well aware that Remus spends lavishly on riotous living, owns no fewer than 40 automobiles, and dispenses enough liquor from his drunk companies to meet the prescriptions of physicians of the whole central of the United States. So it was clear to her that the feds in Cincinnati needed her help. Now, the irony of Willenbrandt is that here, as Remus called her, the czarina of prohibition, uh, she was somebody who liked to drink. Uh, before Prohibition, Mabel Walker Willenbrandt loved her California Calarays. She was a big red wine drinker, loved all the California wines. Um, and I just thought it was really funny that, that George Remus is a teetotaler and Willenbrandt was a drinker. This is Jess Smith. He's also in Boardwalk Empire. Um, and there were many forces working against Willenbrandt, and certainly one of the, the hardest uh, factor working against her were the crooked politicians she had to deal with. Uh, Jess Smith worked at a desk near hers in the Justice Department. He was assistant to her boss, Attorney General Harry Doherty. She was not quite sure what Smith did. She called him a glorified valet. Um, George Remus knew exactly what Jess Smith did because Jess Smith was George Remus' liaison in the federal government. Smith is the one who got Remus all of those whiskey certificates he needed to get the alcohol out of the warehouses. And Smith also promised protection to Remus. George Remus was not going to get arrested. If he was arrested, he would not be convicted. If he was convicted, he would not go to prison. So Remus had a very uh, special relationship with Jess Smith. He would meet him. He probably paid him more than a million dollars in protection money. Um, and he really believed that this was going to be a, a safeguard um, for him throughout his prohibition career. He called Jess Smith his ace in the hole. Um, but this arrangement would not last very long. So here's another cartoon uh, illustrating the futility of Mabel Walker Willenbrand's job. You know, basically she's up against an ocean of alcohol with a broom. Uh, give the little lady a hand. Um, and one of her biggest problems is the United States itself. You know, the country has two long, craggy borders, 1,800 miles of really porous coastline. There were airplane fleets smuggling alcohol from Mexico to Texas, where it would be put into um, wagons hidden under bales of hay and distributed everywhere. From Canada, fleets were landing um, on the Michigan Peninsula, aided by searchlights, and it was very organized. And on a personal level, you know, there were so many inventive ways of smuggling booze, and Americans figured out all of them. I'll, I'll just talk about a couple of my favorite here. A double amputee boasted that he could hide 36 pints in his prosthetics. There was a raid on a soda parlor in Helena, Montana, where they found squirt guns, you know, children's squirt guns with a two-drink capacity. There were liquor-filled torpedoes on Long Island in New York, liquor submarines that raised and lowered out of sight, and seagoing tugs with compartments hiding enough liquor for 30 New Year's Eve parties. Uh, one of my favorites were that women even hid pints inside of their false rubber breasts. I think we call them chicken cutlets, you know, the things that you use to stack them. They, those were very popular for hiding alcohol. Um, here's another one. Um, at first glance, this woman is uh, holding a book, a leather-bound book titled The Four Swallows. Um, the author is J.B. Corn, a not very subtle reference to John Barleycorn. But if the book, of course, this book is actually a flask. You know, you flip open the top and there's four vials that you can fit your favorite alcohol into, hence The Four Swallows. Um, this brilliant invention was the work of a Brooklyn-based inventor named John Nutry. Um, before Prohibition, he was known for making little books that um, operated as little personal coin banks. But after Prohibition, he decided to make a flask out of these books, a very sort of smart idea. This was patented in February 1921 and became a really popular item. Um, sometimes if anybody's into antiques, you can go on Worth Point or similar and, and find one of these actually from uh, the 1921, 1922. They're quite a bit of money, um, but a really cool artifact to have. So at first glance, this woman's just enjoying her coffee. But oh, what is she doing with her cane? She's dumping a bunch of alcohol <laughs> into her coffee. So this is another popular invention. It was a cane. Um, 
that has a screw, a screw component. You can uh, unscrew it. There's a big glass vial inside. You put your alcohol in there, and you just sort of then discreetly, or not very discreetly, pour, pour it into your coffee. They do have replicas of these. I actually bought one on eBay, and as soon as bars opened up again in New York City, <laughs> I took it out there and just had some fun with it. So um, I like to call this one, my, what a big flask you have. Um, <laughs> But it was actually called the Bootlegger's Life Preserver. And it was a very popular flask, especially with women. Um, women were, were probably the more uh, lucky, I should say, smugglers. And that was because, um, number one, people didn't expect women right away to be smuggling alcohol. They, they soon caught on that women were capable of doing this and willing to do it. But the other thing was that prohibition agents, most of whom were men, um, were either too polite um, to, or too nervous to search women. And in some states, it was actually illegal to search women. You were not allowed to search women. Women took advantage of this and therefore just stuffed alcohol in every part of their body, um, you know, in their garters, in their boots, in their stockings, in their, beneath their big fur coats, and of course beneath their, um, their chicken cutlets or their rubber breasts. Anywhere that they could fit alcohol, they fit alcohol. Um, so they really just used the, the trappings of gender to, to become pretty, pretty successful smugglers. So uh, these are cow shoes. These did not carry liquor, but they were indispensable to bootleggers who brewed moonshine in forests or meadows. You can see that the heels are carved from a, a, a wooden block to resemble hooves, and they would literally cover the tracks of a bootlegger who was trying to evade a prohibition agent on foot. So the prohibition agent would be running after him and looking for a man's shoe prints, but instead just find a bunch of cow tracks um, because of these cow shoes. Um, and so it's just quite ingenious. These have not made a comeback. I keep hoping that they will because he doesn't want a pair of cow shoes. I mean, they're, they're pretty great. Um, and uh, these were, um, uh, somebody did get caught, caught wearing them. These were modeled by a prohibition agent in about 1924. This picture was taken, um, which leads me to Mabel Walker Willenbrand's other big problem, finding good, honest prohibition agents to help her enforce prohibition. Um, the average starting salary for a prohibition agent was $1,200 a year. Um, which was barely enough to make a, a living in some cities in the country. Um, and also, these, these agents knew that they could make so much more money just accepting bribes from George Remus and any of the bootleggers who, who you know, were uh, willing to pay bribes, which all of them were. Qualifications were not required at all. Um, they would recruit prohibition agents who were just hanging around in courthouses, um, traffic cops. You could even have a criminal record and become a prohibition agent. In one of my favorite stories, there was a man who was serving time in an upstate New York prison for murder and armed robbery when he got his prohibition agent badge. And Willebrandt wrote often of her frustration. She wrote that the dominant reality is that the whole problem is one of getting the right men in places of power and enforcement, men of creative thought, of courage, those not slaves to political ambition, and by men I also mean women, lots of them. So this is Franklin Dodge. This is Willem Brandt's best hope. This is her favorite prohibition agent. Um, he was a pedigree guy. He was a, from a very important Michigan family, a long line of politicians, sort of a very prestigious family in Michigan. Um, his father got him a job with the federal government. He was the kind of guy that just kept fail, failing upward, um, you know, just sort of making his way. But Willem Brandt did see some promise and talent in him. He was willing to go undercover. He was willing to... Um, to uh, conduct himself in unorthodox ways to try to get information about bootleggers. And she really appreciated his willingness to go the extra mile. Um, and she decided to sort of anoint him as her ace detective. Um, she sends him to investigate George Remus's empire. And of course, uh, Franklin Dodge succeeds in getting Remus arrested, succeeds in getting him convicted, and George Remus is sent to the Atlanta Penitentiary, um, a federal penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, once Remus is behind bars for violating prohibition laws, Dodge encounters Remus again. Willenbrand sends him down to the Atlanta Penitentiary to investigate um, reported prison corruption among officials there. So by this time, Remus had heard a couple things about Franklin Dodge. He heard that he was amenable to quid pro quo, he would take bribes, he was maybe somebody that could be reasoned with. And Remus starts to look at Dodge as somebody who might be able to help him get out of jail so he could return to Imogene and return to his uh, bootlegging business. So the next time Imogene visits him in the Atlanta penitentiary, Remus asks her to begin cultivating Franklin Dodge. Now Imogene Remus begins cultivating Franklin Dodge, but not quite in the way that George Remus had hoped. 
Um, so at this time, was George Remus is in prison. Imogene Remus is 39 years old, and I just kept encountering newspapers that were talking about women of her type. They called them the middle-aged flapper. Um, a very dangerous species, the middle-aged flapper, very scary. Um, the New York Times said, it is not life, but movement is what she seeks. It is she who does over the old house and builds a new one where her husband is deposited while she goes out in search of culture. So Franklin Dodge becomes Imogene's culture. And to me, this was an interesting theme of the book. You know, women were subverting societal expectations. And, and what were the consequences of this behavior? Um, I think the 1920s were, a, we can all agree, a really singularly rich and dynamic time in American history. I don't think George Ramos or this story could have happened in any other decade. But the 1920s, you know, we had just emerged from World War I. The war swept away a lot of gender norms. Women flooded the workplace. And America found itself in this sort of in-between period afterward. Um, you know, I think people were much more hedonistic after realizing life could be so short short, um, and the Depression had yet to put a damper on everything. So it was just this sort of heady 10-year period um, of hedonism. And in terms of women's advancement, you know, there were many people who were not happy that their moms, their sisters, their wives, their girlfriends, etc., suddenly had the right to vote. So there was a little bit of backlash against that, and backlash against women um, who defied social conventions. They were publicly vilified, um, and people seemed especially accepted, uh, upset about middle-aged flappers because these women should have known better. They were old enough, and they should know better. Um, one newspaper admonished them in this way. Everyone knows that there is a certain type of American woman of a certain age who spends her life trying to be like the girls. The woman who finds herself earnestly mimicking the voice, mannerisms, and dress of the poor little flapper girls of any age is a greater menace than the 16-year-old kind. So the 16-year-old flappers, the young flappers, also had their own culture, of course. Um, there was a flapper magazine. Um, and uh, the magazine was great. The tagline was not for old fogies. Uh, and they, they had a great definition for flapper, one that I think really needs to make a comeback. A flapper was somebody who had, quote, a jitney body and a limousine mind. They developed their own slang. Um, here's some of the flapper's dictionary. Uh, Biscuit was a pedable flapper. A boob pickler was a girl who detains her father's out-of-town guests. And sweetie, in a very passive-aggressive way, meant anybody a flapper hates. <laughs> Um, uh, the, it, there was a, a lot of male backlash against, uh, against flappers. I love this little tidbit. The, the students of Sil Syracuse University and other colleges were worried that flappers' brazen behavior would make them look more effeminate. effeminate. So they organized um, whole clubs across the country and colleges to protest smoking among women, women who wore flopping galoshes, and the intrusion of women into realms heretofore restricted to men. Um, they even try to uh, portray flappers as sexual predators. Uh, this is one of my favorite cartoons about that. Um, if you can read the, <laughs> read the middle one is my favorite. Unsuspecting boys forced to endure such unseemly ac exercises as cheek dancing. <laughs> God, cheek dancing, it's so scandalous. Um, but Willebrand herself admired flappers' brazenness and she envied their freedom. Um, she had a great quote. When I was a girl, she told one reporter, it was considered a sin to kiss a man before one was engaged, and now the so-called flapper kisses who she likes, and she is none the worse for it. So this is J. Edgar Hoover, um, probably a familiar figure to anybody here who's uh, into, into prohibition history. Um, he's just a baby here. You know, he was a um, brand new director of the Bureau of Investigation, which of course was the precursor to the FBI. It wasn't called the FBI yet. Uh, in 1924, he was 29 years old. And he got this job because Mabel Walker Willenbrandt recommended him for the job. I love the fact that, that she was the one who really got his career going. Um, and, um, you know, he got promoted despite his a little bit of a shady record at the Bureau. He was involved in the Palmer Raids, in which a lot of uh, thousands of suspected anarchists and communists were illegally arrested and detained. Um, there was one positive thing about J. Edgar Hoover. He was really serious and determined to have an honest force of prohibition agents. He did not want anyone taking bribes. He did not want anyone in business with bootleggers. Um, he really wanted a, a solid and honest force, and he was sincere about this. So, <clears throat> excuse me, he too starts hearing shady things about Franklin Dodge, that he's running around with George Remus's wife, that he's conducting business, he's stealing whiskey certificates, he's trying to do this and that. And he decides that he's going to send one of his own agents to spy on Franklin Dodge. So there's a little situation of spy versus spy. Um, and what does... Um, Hoover's agent discover. He discovers that, uh, that Franklin Dodge is gathering Remus's whiskey certificates and endeavoring to sell them. He's taking prized possessions from George Remus's mansion. And at one point, 
Hoover's agent literally catches Franklin Dodge with his pants down. Now, I don't know, I, in nonfiction, it's exceedingly rare to get to write a scene where somebody is literally caught with their pants down, and it was a very fun scene to write, I have to admit. Um, just to put things into perspective, um, in this book, J. Edgar Hoover is one of the good guys. So here is George Remus in jail. Um, fantastic picture of him. You just love that even in jail, he's wearing his natty three-piece suit. Don't let the morose expression fool you. George Remus was living like a king in jail. Um, Atlanta Penitentiary had an entire section called Millionaire's Row devoted to very popular and uh, powerful bootleggers. Um, these men were able to decorate, redecorate their cells to make it homey. They had their own maids, they had their own cooks, they were able to throw dinners on long mahogany tables set with fresh linens. Um, he, he threw boot, uh, dinners with this bootlegger from Savannah named Willie Hard, and they would invite everybody. It was a grand old time. Imogene cleaned his cell on her hands and knees. She became quite popular. They called her the angel of the pen. But still, George Remus was miserable. You know, when you're in, in prison, you cannot control anything. And George Remus was all about control. Um, and he spent a lot of time writing letters to Imogene, worrying about what he's hearing about her, her relationship with Franklin Dodge and wondering, is, is she really cultivating him? Is she really getting Franklin Dodge to get him out of jail? Um, and as he suspected their growing romantic relationship, he started writing these letters. I spoke about his way with words earlier, and I just want to read uh, two excerpts from my favorite letters because people just don't write letters like this anymore, and you never think of, of a bootlegger, especially somebody who's just self-taught, to sort of write with such um, florid uh, enthusiasm, I guess I should say. To the only true and sweetest little girl in the whole dear world, to the apple of my eye, not one but both, how glorious it feels to know that my sweetheart is cheery again. Little one, you do not know what it means to have you away from me for so long. The minutes turn into days, the days turn into months, and the months into years. I crave you. I would devour you. I care only for you, a human madness. All other matters are infinitesimal against you and only you. Therefore, you see how I burst into a human cloud, burst with a vitriolic tongue interspersed. My only wife, how is it that you are a monkey? You are a centipede. You are a gem, you are a jewel. You are all the combination of all the aforesaid in one. If I but had you this very moment, I would demonstrate all the foregoing with a real vigor and vim unexcelled. How about it? <laughs> um, I don't know when centipede became a term of endearment, um, but as I said, Remus had many names for her and centipede was, was one of them. So he would write these letters and every time she came to visit him, um, he would say, how's it going with Dodge? Are you cultivating Dodge? Am I any closer to getting out of prison? And Imogene would just answer and say, don't worry, Daddy, Mr. Dodge is our friend. So this is Harry Truesdale. Um, he is the man that Imogene Remus and Franklin Dodge hired to kill George Remus. Um, and just to give you an idea um, of how crazy things get in this story, um, Truesdale, a hardened criminal, criminal um, was so afraid of both George and Imogene Remus that he decided that he was going to be the one who was gonna, going to be killed, and he decided to get the hell away from both of them. Um, he was terrified of both of these people, and it just sort of struck me as funny because, you know, this guy kills people for a living. Um, so, yeah. This is my final slide. This is George Remus's tombstone. He's buried in Riverside Cemetery in Falmouth, Kentucky. Um, and according to lore, um, someone made a comment that George Remus, having lived the life that he lived, did not deserve to have angels on his tombstone. So the very next day, somebody went out with a hammer and decided to smash the wings off of the angels on George Remus's tombstone. And this is how it appears today. The angel wings are still absent from George Remus's tombstone. Um, and I like to conclude by saying the people who do what I do, who write narrative nonfiction, you know, we often lament, lament that we are beholden to the historical record. Uh, we're not allowed to create dialogue. We're not allowed to invent characters. We're not allowed to invent, um, you know, events. Um, but this is the very first time um, when the dead people did exactly what I wanted them to do. <laughs> so anyway, that is, that's my presentation. If anybody has any, any uh, questions or wants to share their own lurid family history that I can, <laughs> I can talk about my next, I, I always love to hear people's history. So any questions or stories? Um, oh, thank you. Karen Abbott, thank you so much. Thanks. And um, if anyone has any questions, yes, a round of applause. Sure. If anyone has any questions, I can come over to you with this mic or you can use this mic up here to talk. 
Just raise your hand. Any questions? I think everyone's waiting for the book signing downstairs. Happy to go do that. And also, I'm very accessible online. If you have questions after the fact, I'm happy to email me and I'm happy to chat. Thank you again for the wonderful presentation. Another round of applause for Karen Abbott. And as a reminder, we will be holding a book signing uh, right now uh, in the retail store on the first floor of the museum. So we'll see you there. And thank you all for coming. We appreciate it.